In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today is the penultimate Sunday of October, which is especially dedicated by the Church to the missions. This observance was established by Pius XI in 1926 in order to foster in all the children of the Church the zeal for the missions. A mission in the strictest sense refers to men sent by the Church to bring the light of the Gospel into regions previously ignorant of it. But in a fuller and broader sense, it refers to bringing souls to eternal salvation by apostolic activities, such as establishing Mass centers and making the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass available to people, preaching, catechizing, and administering the Holy Sacraments. That is why a saint like Saint Alphonsus Liguori is rightly considered one of the greatest missionaries of his time, even though he and his first companions preached and exercised the apostolate not among pagans in uncivilized lands, but among Italian Catholics, who in many cases dwelt less than 200 miles from Rome. But the truth is that those Catholics were in dire need of religious instruction and spiritual assistance, in particular of the regular and worthy reception of the Holy Sacraments. And something similar can be said of St. Leonard of Port Morris, who is also among the greatest missionaries of modern times, and yet conducted his apostolate among the Catholics of Italy. The point here is to show that missionary activity can be reduced ultimately to what we call the apostolate, that is, to lead souls to the true knowledge, service, and love of Christ, and thus to eternal salvation. Now, if we accept instruction as a preparation for baptism and other activities geared for converts, most of the missionary activity today is done among baptized Catholics who have kept the faith, despite the general apostasy from the faith that resulted from Vatican II. The worst effect of that false and awful counsel was the loss of faith that flowed from its substitution of the poison of modernism and ecumenism for the holy Catholic faith. But there were many others, other dreadful consequences, all with devastating effects for the salvation of souls. Among these, we must mention first the drastic reduction of the number of truly Catholic masses offered to Almighty God. Before the Council, tens of thousands of masses were offered every single day, and this around the whole world. <clears throat> but soon after the Council, the number of truly Catholic masses offered was reduced to a minimum. To the handful of priests who remained faithful, rejected the Council and Paul VI, and said the true Mass here and there. <clears throat> now, in order to save our souls, we must persevere in, in our, preserve in ourselves and profess the Catholic faith integrally. Moreover, the source of the actual graces we need to save our souls is the sacrifice of the Mass, and the chief means of grace are the sacraments. Hence, after the disaster of Vatican II and its aftermath, we are in dire need of missions. <clears throat> missions intended not now to bring the knowledge of Christ to faraway lands, since that was done in the past centuries, but rather missions to instruct and confirm the faithful in their faith 
and to preach it integrally to the increasing number of Sede Vacantis Catholics who are scattered around the world, as well as to all those who seriously want to embrace the Catholic faith after rejecting Vatican II and its heresies. <clears throat> we need missions to bring to all of them, if not frequent, at least regular access to the Mass and to confession, and to provide to them the possibility to receive confirmation and, in the case of the dying, the last rites. <clears throat> According to the mind of the Church, everyone should cooperate with her missionary work, each according to his state in life and his ability. How then can you help with the missions? To begin with, you can help our seminary, since the lofty end of any seminary is to provide laborers for the field, that is, to form young men into priests who are both virtuous and well instructed in theology, as is necessary for their sacred duty of saving souls. <laughs> as you may have heard, the seminary is in need of an extension in order to be able to receive more vocations. If you are able to do so, a contribution for this noble project would be a good way to help in the work of future missions, since any future missionary must, must start at a seminary. Besides that, of course, you can help various missions directly especially if there is one whose chapel you attend. <clears throat> but the material arms of the faithful, though not to be neglected, is by no means the principal way of helping the missions. In the work of the missions, there are two aspects. The first is the material and tangible, tangible one, the other the spiritual and invisible. And, al and although the first one is necessary in as much as we are men and not angels, the second one, the spiritual, is by far the most important. Because as the psalm says, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Indeed, the fruits of any missionary activity come from the blessing and the grace of God, according to what St. Paul says, I have planted, Apollo watered, but God gave the increase. Therefore, neither he that planteth is anything, nor he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. In other words, the spiritual fertility of any missionary activity comes not from the external activity of the priests or from any other human source, but from the grace of Christ. Hence, the most important way for you to cooperate with missions and the salvation of souls is to help in obtaining from God's goodness the graces that are absolutely necessary for that end. <clears throat> And how is it possible that you can help in that? Because of the communion of saints, your prayers, good works and sufferings can help other members of the church, such as the priests involve, involved in the, activity, in the active apostolates. Besides, if you are in the state of grace, your sacrifices offered up to God for the salvation of souls can obtain for others from God's mercy many actual graces, such as conversion, perseverance, and the like. <clears throat> the Church has established two patrons of the missions. The first is St. Francis Xavier, who traveled by foot and by, by ship through immense regions, preaching the gospel everywhere, catechizing and baptizing thousands and thousands of people, 
and they from many countries. This shows obviously the necessity of the active apostolates according to what St. Paul writes to the Romans. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then sh shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe in, in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? But the church, named also as co-patron of the missions, none other than a fully cloistered Carmelite nun, St. Therese of Lisieux. Once she passed the gates of the convent, she never left it until her death. But in fact, she considered that in the cloister, she could consecrate herself more fully to a life of self-denial and mortification, and that her sacrifice would be all the more fruitful for souls, as she would be deprived of the consolation of working actively among them. Thus, living a hidden life, she used to obtain by her little sacrifice, sacrifices many graces for missionaries who were working in the remotest parts of the world. Among the graces she could obtain from God by sacrifice and prayer was the opening of the heart of those listening to the missionaries so that they might be willing to abandon paganism and embrace the faith. By choosing then a, car a cloistered nun as a patron of missions, the church teaches us that one can be of invaluable help to the missions through hidden prayer and sacrifice. <clears throat> and here note that it is not required that you be perfect or a saint to obtain great graces for the missions. If you are in the state of grace and offer prayer and sacrifices for this end, God, who is inclined to exercise towards us more his mercy than his justice, will be much inclined to overlook all the imperfections of your work and accept it. Charity towards neighbor is particularly pleasing to the sacred heart, and hence when our Lord sees us trying to exercise it, he is moved to overlook the imperfections of the act and even our own personal faults, according to what St. Peter says. But before all things, have a constant mutual charity, for charity covereth a multitude of sins. If we are self-centered and indifferent to the eternal salvation of others, our self-love, besides multiplying our sins, does not allow God to show us as much of his mercy as he is greatly inclined to do. But if, out of charity, we make an effort to forget ourselves a little and to consider the needs of other souls, then we incline, incline God to forget our sins. Of this we can be certain, because our Lord says, Blessed are the merciful, for they, they shall obtain mercy. He does not say, that they shall be completely blameless before God, for that is not possible for our misery. But he does assure us that, he, that we shall obtain mercy for all our sins. Then, according to the psalm, as the Father has compassion on his children, so will the Lord have, have compassion on us, for he knows our frame and will remember that we are dust. Be then generous in offering sacrifices and prayers for the missionaries, for the priests who are now working actively for the salvation of souls, so that, far from being indifferent to the missions, you may be able to say yourself what St. Therese said to her sister. We offer our prayers and our sacrifices 
for the apostles of the Lord. We ourselves must be their apostles, while they, by their words and example, evangelize the souls of our brethren. What a noble mission is ours. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.